Well, hey, Beat Family, I am so very excited to introduce to some and to welcome to others a new friend of mine whose name is Amir, and uh, he is uh, really passionate about end time prophecy and all things concerning the nation of Israel. His testimony is absolutely amazing. And I know that many of you who watch this channel, you really love end time events and you really love to learn a little bit more about the role that Israel is playing in the unfolding and the unveiling of God's divine, eternal eschatological plan. And Amir is going to come and share with us things that he knows because he is from there. He lives there. He grew up there and he has insights into the nation of Israel that I do not have. And so I am so very excited to uh, welcome on to my channel, Amir. Amir, so glad that you are here today, my brother. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Alan. It's my pleasure to be on your program. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, let's just start off and tell me, uh, do me a favor, tell us a little bit about your testimony. Um, mm. How did you come to Christ? You have a very interesting testimony as it relates to how you actually became a believer? Well, I was born a little bit over 40 years ago. I was born to a Jewish family in the outskirts of Jerusalem. My parents divorced when I was three years old. Then I moved to live with my father's sister, my aunt, for three more years. And uh, from there, uh, the welfare system in Israel uh, took us, and me and my brother were in foster care. Uh, different families until I was uh, almost 18 years old. During that time, um, I did not see any any hope in my life. Uh, it, it was very, very hard, very, very, uh, I guess, tough, tough life, you know, when you don't live in your own place, when uh, you have to work for your living since you're 12 years old. And and what happened is that it's at the end, age of 17, I reached a point where I thought, you know, I don't see hope in my future because there's nothing good now and there was nothing good in the past. So I just decided to uh, uh, end my life. I, I prepared uh, myself to uh, to take a huge uh, amount of pills and not to wake up the next morning. And that night, I remember something, now I know what that something is, shook me and, and, and I decided to give the world one last uh, a chance, basically. Um, and, and that was the week that I learned that uh, one of my best friends in school is actually a Jew who believes in Yeshua, in Jesus. He's a he's a Messianic uh, Jew. And so what happened is that uh, he invited me to his place to study together for the uh, SATs uh, exams. When I came to his house, everybody's uh, before lunch, holding hands, closing their eyes, praying without any prayer book, thanking God for me and for lunch. And they ended up the prayer with the words, Beshem Yeshua, in the name of Jesus. And uh, I was shocked. And then they started explaining who Jesus is, who Yeshua is, how he's the promised Messiah to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. I didn't understand much then, but then I prayed. Somebody told me, why don't you pray and ask God? And I prayed that God will show me who Yeshua is. And that happened a few weeks later. And then when and the day after I prayed, uh, I went to work before school and I opened a newspaper because um, I put together the morning parts of the newspaper. And, and I saw a big advertisement for uh, the movie Jesus, the Jesus film of Campus Crusade that was showing in Jerusalem's uh, movie theater. Um, and that was uh, 1990. Um, and I was, I was, you know, shocked. I, mean, I just prayed last night to ask God to show me who Jesus is. And the next morning I get an answer. So I went to see the movie. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's all about fulfilling the prophecies of the Old Testament on the screen. And you see the whole Gospel of Luke there. And it was amazing. And at the very end, they give you a chance to receive Jesus to your heart. By the way, the, the Jewish, the Israeli authorities, once they understood what this movie is all about, they removed it a day after. Uh, <laughs> so it wasn't anymore in a regular movie theater in Israel. So mm. it was what a coincidence. Huh? Whoa, what an amazing timing. So I accepted the Lord that night. I came back home and I told everyone about it. 
Weeks later, a few weeks later, my foster family kicked me out because of, they, they thought it's going to pass, but they just saw that it's, it's getting stronger and stronger. I'm, I'm definitely not going to leave that newfound faith uh, behind me. And then I moved from, again from place to place and then eventually got baptized, joined the Israeli military, and the rest is history. But, but again, this was, uh, I reached the lowest point in my life. I looked up and the Lord was there to uh, reach out and to not only grant me life now, but through my decision to trust in the Lord, I was also granted eternal life. And that is the most important thing. Wow. Wow. What a blessing that testimony is, uh, guys. And that's just an example of how the Lord is so awesome and he is so sovereign that he doesn't need a church. He doesn't need an evangelist. He doesn't need some sort of televangelist or a prophet or anyone. If he wants to save you, he can get his message of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness to us in any way, shape, or form. So thank you so much for sharing that. So let's jump into the content that I think many of my viewers are interested in. Let's get in here and let's have a good time discussing a topic that you and I are very, very uh, similarly uh, interested in which regard with regards to is Bible prophecy. All right, so we're just gonna jump in, all right? So can you, can you help us understand because you have spent uh, to my knowledge, your entire life living in Israel, and you grew up there, and 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 unlike myself, who I'm trying to learn a little bit more about the role that Israel plays in the unveiling of the end times, but because this is uh, your upbringing, can you just tell us, and I want to give you free reign to spend as much time as you want on this, but can you help us non-Israeli people understand what role will Israel play in the end time events? And what are some signs that we need to be looking for or very well may already be going on right now that we can point to to see the unveiling of God's divine plan? Well, Alan, I, I, first of all, I will start by saying that the, the importance of studying Bible prophecy is tremendous. And I think that Bible prophecy, which contains almost, uh, it, the Bible is almost a third with Bible prophecy, almost uh, 30% of the Bible is prophecies, future events. And uh, oftentimes this uh, portion of the Bible is being either ignored or completely uh, misunderstood and, uh, and uh, taken out of context. And therefore, there's a great ignorance among Christians in regards to that topic. And, and un unfortunately, there's a lot of kooks also that are teaching stuff that cause many Christians to stay away from Bible prophecy. And yet, at the same time, it is the prophets that were so important in the life of Israel to give them an understanding of the future Messiah and his role. Because think about it, Alan, the two disciples in Matthew 25, the two disciples that walked away from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, if you remember, they were disciples of Jesus. And Jesus joined them. And they, although it was Sunday morning, they already know that the Lord is not in the grave. They already know that the angel said that he's alive. They were still sad. They were still angry. They were confused. They were embarrassed. And Jesus is listening to all of their rant about all of these events. And then he said to his disciples, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe that which the prophets have said. You mm. see, if you understood, if you believed everything that Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea all wrote, you would have known that I had to come, I had to suffer, I had to die, and then I had to resurrect. But you did not believe. You heard it and did not believe. And now comes the point of the future of my nation. Because, you know, Israel is a miracle. No matter how you can look at it, there is no logical explanation to the rebirth of a nation after 2,000 years of being away from its land, mm. the rebirth of a language that was not being spoken anywhere, the re rebirth of, of a land that was a barren wasteland. You know, Mark Twain shows up in the middle of the 1800s to Israel, and he writes that even the cactus, which is a great friend of the desert, did not live there. I mean, it was that bad. And so God restored the land, restored the people back to their land, restored their language. This is something that no one has explanation to unless 
you read Bible prophecy and you know that God promised the nation of Israel that at the very end, he will bring them back to their land. And so the return of the Jews back to their land in the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948, can a nation be born, uh, you know, in a moment at once? Yes, a nation was born immediately. And as soon as Zion was ready to give birth, it did. And so Israel was born in 1948. And since then, it's in a constant battle to survive. And if you study the wars of Israel, and if you go beyond all the heroic stories, you will find out that unless the Lord fought for us, we would have been dis long ago completely dead. And so God not only brought the Jews back to their land, but he sustains them in the land up until today. So that is a huge thing, because when Jesus spoke to the disciples about the signs of the end, he gave them an interesting parable on the fig tree. And he said, learn the parable from the fig tree. When its leaves comes back to be green and, and bare fruit, then you know that the summer is near. The fig tree is a symbol of the national um, uh, privileges of Israel. You know, you can be olive tree as a Gentile. You can be a fig tree, excuse me, a, a, a vine as a Gentile, because these are the spiritual and religious privileges that now you have also. But as a Gentile, you cannot be the fig tree because that is this the national privilege of Israel. And Israel is being born now. Nationally, it's being born right now. And so the Bible says, when you see, he's telling the church, when you see the fig tree coming back to life, when the church sees that Israel is back to life um, uh, nationally, you know that summer is near. So this is already a big, big sign of the very, that we are at the very end times. But, you know, when you sail through the book of Revelation, you can clearly see that maybe God restored Israel back physically to their land, but now he has to restore them spiritually also back to himself. Mm. That has not happened yet. We are now at the point where the Jewish people are back in their land, but they're not back to their God and they're not yet acknowledging their Messiah. Not yet. I'm saying not yet because Paul said to the church in Rome, in Romans 11, that eventually all Israel will be saved. But he said something has to happen first. You know, the time of the Gentiles have to come in. There has to be something. And so we, we're, we're going to see something very interesting, Alan, that is going to happen in the land of Israel. First of all, according to the book of Ezekiel, after the restoration of the land and the people back to the land, there will be a big war. A war that oftentimes we tend to push aside and not think of, but... It's a war that unless God will, would, you know, intervene, Israel wouldn't exist anymore. It's a war that is called by, by many Gog and Magog. But the, that war in Ezekiel is actually called Gog from the land of Magog. And that is, of course, a war that most scholars believe will come from the north, by, led by Russia. But Persia, which is Iran and Turkey and others, will join it. And, and the Bible doesn't say that the that the generals of the Israeli army are going to defeat the enemy. The Bible doesn't say that the Israeli secret service will defeat the enemy. The Bible says that the God of Israel will defeat the enemy. We will be powerless. We won't be able to sustain that blow. But God, is, once again, will stand for his nation because he's not done with them. He's not through with them. He still has a plan for them. And I think that um, now comes... He's dealing with them spiritually. Israel will survive that war. There will be some messianic aspirations. People will think, wow, once again, this is amazing. But then comes a world leader, a world leader that will arise from the Western European former Roman Empire and will assume power and his power will be given to him from the dragon himself, from Satan himself. He will receive authority and power and a name and a, and a, and a, and a, and in a position and uh, you know he's going to be very very deceitful because at first he will show as great friend of Israel the bible says that he will cut a covenant in daniel chapter 9 it he will the bible says he will um, uh, you know confirm a covenant and and that covenant will allow the jewish people after 2000 years to build 
make yet another temple on the Temple Mount and begin the um, uh, uh, sacrificial ceremonies there. But the Bible says that that same man, that son of perdition, evil person, will bring halfway through the seven years uh, uh, deal with Israel, halfway he's going to break it, he's going to put a stop to the sacrificial ceremonies, and together with Daniel, you can add Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and you know that he will enter that temple and declare himself as God. Mm. And this is where, you know, the Jewish people will part ways from, you know, with him, and no longer they will see the Antichrist as some sort of Messiah, but now they will see him as the enemy and he will start you know persecuting them like never before you know the holocaust will pale compares to what israel might go through wow. through the tribulation because we know that daniel chapter 12 in the first two verses says that that time of trouble you know i can that time of trouble that israel is going to go through will be such as never happened to israel before mm. which means even the Holocaust was not as bad. And the Bible says that yet God will, the remnant, God is going to save them. And uh, we know that um, because in the book of Revelation, God has a very big portion for Israel in that whole dealing with the world. Because look, the church is gone and now the, we have a world without the church that its primary job is to preach the gospel. Who's going to preach the gospel right now? So God is first sending two witnesses to Jerusalem to preach. Those two witnesses will be killed by the, you know, by people. But of course, the Antichrist himself and Satan doesn't want them because they are bringing hope, life, and eternal life to people if they choose Jesus. But at the same time, those two will come back to life and God will take them. Then comes 144,000. We know that they're Israelites and Jews because they come from the 12 tribes of Israel. So you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to know that. And you know that God is choosing from among the Jews because the church is gone. And these people are going to be evangelists to preach the gospel, but primarily to their own people. Because at that time, so many of the Gentiles, I'm not saying Gentiles will not be saved, many will be, but I'm saying primarily now is refocusing us on, on the nation of Israel. And we know that eventually, eventually we know that God is going to prepare a place for the Jewish people that will accept Christ in the desert. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, that nation that gave birth to the Messiah, that woman, God will prepare a place for her for a period of 1260 days. This is the latter part of the tribulation, the three and a half years where Israel, the remnant of Israel will be kept there. God will sustain them. And eventually once Jesus comes back, as Zechariah 12 says, they will look at him when they pierce and they will cry and repent. And of course, they will be saved as a Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 11. So you see, God has a plan for Israel, Alan, and he's not done with Israel as some Christian think. He did not replace Israel with the church as some Christian think. And he has a wonderful uh, future for Israel. However, and this is where I will conclude, Israel's, um, Israel has an expiration date, and the expiration date is set by the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31 when he said, Only when the sun, the moon, and the stars will depart from me, then Israel will no longer be a nation before me. And when will that happen, that there will be no more need for the moon and the stars and the sun? In the new Jerusalem, because Jesus is going to be our menorah, our light, our um, a source of light. And therefore, I must say, Israel still has a future until the end of the millennial kingdom. And then when God will make new heavens, new earth, and the new Jerusalem will come down, then the only people that will ever have, an, I mean, the only identity you need 
There's no more Israel or not Israel. It's my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life will reside in that city. Hmm. So we have a very amazing, full of event future for Israel. And we have a very good end, but a very painful process to get there to that end. And I want to urge people to not think that God is done with Israel, through with Israel, or replaced them. Share the gospel with them and spare them, at least some of them, from the horrific future tribulation that is going to befall upon them that is known in the scriptures as Jacob's trouble, the trouble of Jacob of Israel, and also in, in Daniel, it's also known as a time of trouble, such as not been seen since they were a nation. So this is, in a nutshell, the, the future of Israel. And I, I just, I'm amazed to see how with all the wars and the rumors of wars that we see all around us, God is still on the move. You know, throughout the Ukraine war, more Jews started coming back from Ukraine and Russia than than ever before in the last 12 years. So mm. you see, you see, man is doing their shenanigans of wars. God is doing his thing of bringing the Jews back to their land. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that is that is awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, for my listeners and viewers who are wondering, you know, hey, well, well, you know, I don't see a whole lot of stuff going on with Israel. What? How is God going to fulfill some of these covenants that he promised in the Old Testament. And guys, that's one of the things, right? So um, we know that God is not a God that he should lie, right? The Bible says that. Uh, and so therefore, any promises that God made to the nation of Israel that have been unfulfilled, we know that there has to be a time in the future where God is going to actually be able to fulfill those covenants that he made to the nation of Israel. And that's going to be a great time. Now, uh, for, for people out there who might be loving to kind of look at modern day things, right? Things that are going on in the world right now. Are, are there any, and you may or may not have an answer to this, but is there anything that you can think of that maybe, let's say, that's gone on over the last five years or so that we can point to that says, oh, yeah, that happened over at Israel. And so that seems to be moving the, the, the end time event uh, calendar forward or, okay, wow, when this thing happened over here, that was also a fulfillment of prophecy. And then you also mentioned the idea of the, the temple being rebuilt. Uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, what's there right now on the Temple Mount and how is that going to happen? And uh, just talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So first of all, we have to understand, you know, uh, the last few years, definitely we saw amazing things and your, you know, our political stand uh, has nothing to do with it because you know God is the one who raises and God is the one who is taking down leaders and and he's he will eventually do his will. Okay, and so we know that um, uh, you know about in the last five years or so there was a great move in the Middle East. I'm not talking about anywhere else around the world. I'm focusing on, on the Middle East. Two things happen. One. Jerusalem was recognized as capital of Israel, not just by the Jews themselves, but also by the number one superpower of, of, of the world. Thus, the American embassy moved to Jerusalem. We know that happened. But also something very interesting happened, Alan. Alan, for the last, I don't know, 60, 70, almost 80 years, the Arab countries around us refrained from having peace with Israel without first having us solving or resolving the whole issue we have with the Palestinians. So we do have peace with Jordan and, and do have peace with Egypt, but but the rest of the Arab world tried to stay away from us because they said, first, solve the Palestinian issue, then we'll have peace with you. Then something else happened, what called the Abraham Accords. Something else happened that moved the wheel towards something completely different. Now we have it's the peace with the Arab countries around us that's supposed to lead us to the peace with the Palestinians, which I personally don't believe will happen. But what I want to say is that biblically, Alan, in the book of you know, Ezekiel, in the same chapter that describes the war that is coming against Israel, something very interesting is written there. It says that Sheba and Dedan will protest 
the attack on Israel. Sheba and Didan is the area of the Saudi Peninsula and the Gulf countries over there. That's the, the historical part of that part of the land. How come that part is protesting a war against the Jews that's supposed to be their enemies? Well, it's because throughout the process of the last couple of years, they became friends and allies of Israel right now. We have peace with Bahrain. We have peace with the UAE. We have very, very warm relations, with, even with the Saudis to this day. And we, we began having peace also with Sudan and Morocco right now. That's something that the, the armament of and the shenanigans of the Ayatollahs es escalated basically because or accelerated because they're afraid of Iran more than they are loving the, Israel. And they thought, you know, the uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they are now the befriending Israel in order for us to help them to protect themselves from Iran. So we see something very interesting happening. We see that the Ezekiel description of the Middle East is coming to pass before our very eyes. Mm. We see we see the Iranian involvement in Syria, the Russian involvement in Syria. We see that the Turks are not yet decided where they want against us or with us, but eventually, once that plays, uh, you know, for their interest, they'll come against us. Of, of course, my point is this: you know, you can be the smartest analyst of Middle East affairs, and you will still be wrong if you go against what the Bible says, because eventually. The Bible is found more accurate than all of those predictions. And now we have peace with, with that part that is called Sheba and Didan. And they are protesting all of those things that are coming against the ally that is now defending them. It's very interesting to see that. So we have the Jerusalem issue. We have the Abraham Accords issue. But now comes also the part that Israel, as of last year, chose a government of change, which is a very weak government leaning on the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the only government in the entire Middle East that is leaning on such a, a movement that is outlawed by most Arab countries also. And now, because we are so, we are perceived weak, we see an, an, a growing intention of our enemies to come up against us. And they're bolder, they are stronger than ever, and they are not afraid of us anymore. That's what I can say. And so, for Ezekiel war to even start, you need a weak Israel, but you also need a weak America. Because if America is, uh, is our biggest ally, and America is not even mentioned as someone that will come to help us in the Ezekiel war, then something has to happen to America that will make it unable to help us or right. not wanting to help us. Mm -hmm. So we see those things happening simultaneously right now and um it's quite amazing to see it you know and we as believers we are citizens of the heavenlies we are ambassadors of christ now here and slowly slowly as we see globalism liberalism as we see wokeism as we see all of these things taking over the whole world we clearly see that our identity with our earthly citizenship is fading away and our bond with our heavenly citizenship is getting stronger and stronger. Mm. Yeah, oh, I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, I actually did a video, you guys. I'll put a link to it below about the role that America plays in end time events. And it's so interesting, you know, when you start studying end time events, you hear all of these other nations and different things. We know Israel is the key player, but you know, you start thinking like, well, wow, America is like the leading world power as of 2022. But why is it that nowhere in the Bible do we see the word America or we see the nation of America even shown? So, you know, makes scholars believe that something must happen between now and when the end time events actually occur that would cause America to no longer be a key player in God's eternal uh, eschatological time frame, if you will. But that's a whole nother story. Um, now, also the, the Temple Mount. Tell me a little bit about, um, you know, and then we'll, uh, we'll tell people about how they can uh, support you. But uh, I know that that is a huge thing because in order for the 
the the Israel Israel uh, the Jewish people to be able to offer sacrifices again, which we know is something as you mentioned earlier that the Antichrist is going to try to establish some sort of peace treaty, promising that the Jewish people will be able to re uh, reinstitute their sacrifices. Well, in order for that to happen, there has to be a temple. Right. But right now, what's there? Right now, and as of the last almost 1,600 years, the Temple Mount is under the foot of the Gentiles. It's not in the hands of Israel. And the Bible says so. Only once that will come to an end, that's when Israel will be saved. But until then, you know, it's not going to happen. But what, what I'm trying to say is that... Uh, it, you know, but the temple of, the, of Israel was destroyed by the Romans, the second one, in 70 AD. Then there was an attempt to build many other things there. But eventually, the Muslims built there in the 7th century two structures. One is at the end of the 7th century. One is the beginning of the 8th one. One is the Dome of the Rock. And believe it or not, the Dome of the Rock originally was built where the, where the Jewish temple used to stand. And uh, it was like right there covering it. They believed that the Temple of Solomon was standing there. Therefore, um, we have to put it there. And then the Al-Aqsa Mosque, that structure was built with a, with a silver dome. That was built a few years later. And those two structures have been standing there since that time. Later on, the, the Crusaders turned them into churches for a short time. And then Muslim came back and turned them back to Islamic places. And, and right now, Although Israel is back in the land and the Jews are back in Jerusalem and Jerusalem is back their capital, the Temple Mount is not in our hands. I mean, we, we, it's a jurisdiction of, of Israel, but the religious jurisdiction, the authority on the Temple Mount when it comes to religious affairs is in the hands of the Muslim people. And every time they want to incite their people, the only thing they need to say, and they've been doing that, is the Jews are about to take over the Temple. The Jews are about to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Jews are about to destroy the Dome of the Rock. And Alan, you will see, by the time you're going to air this show, there will be more riots based on that same lie, and that is going to feed itself to more violence and more and more things. But eventually, there's going to be that war, that war that we talked about in, in, in Ezekiel, that will probably bring an end to radical Islam and the search for some global religion that will give us better hope, better future, better security. This is the one world religion that will offer people, I wouldn't say salvation, but hope through good works, good deeds, good feels. It's all about man and not about God. Christ is going to be out of the, 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 the whole picture there for them. And then, of course, in, in that climate, the Jews will receive back the right to build a temple there. They will build a temple there, but that temple won't last for too long because the Antichrist three and a half years later enter. And eventually when Jesus comes back, and that's the most important thing, if you read Zechariah very, very carefully, chapter 14 says that behold, the Lord will come and his feet will stand on Mount of Olives the Mount of Olives is going to split half to the north, half to the south, and a valley from east to west will be created, which means the Temple Mount, where it stands today, will disappear, basically. Mm -hmm. It will be gone because that valley that is crossing the Mount of Olives will be from east to west. That's the place that will be gone. And the fourth temple, which is the temple Jesus will reign from throughout the millennial kingdom, will be Further north, it will be a bigger and nicer and a different uh, setup. And that is so that this Temple Mount that we're looking at is a source of strife, is a source of war, is a source of deception, a source of blindness. And, and even the Holy Spirit in Ezekiel in the first chapters, in, in chapter 8, 9, and 10, Ezekiel describes that even at the time of the Old Testament, there was such pagan worship there that the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of the presence of God left the temple, moved up to Mount of Olives and left. So that temple mount and that temple, even though it was standing a few more years until it was destroyed, was already without God. Mm -hmm. It was already been given to deception. And so I don't have too many hopes about this temple mount. This temple mount is not my 
my eyes are on, first of all, Jesus. And then, of course, when I come back with him after seven years, I'm going to have him ruling the world from a different temple and not even this temple. Mount. This temple mount would actually not only be gone, there would be a river that Zechariah and Ezekiel describes. Half will go to the Mediterranean, half will go to the Dead Sea. And that's how the Dead Sea will be revived as well. Mm. So, so this Temple Mount is temporary. You know, it's not going to stand for too long. It will be a source of lots of violence, lots of deception. But eventually, when Christ comes back, it's going to be gone. Yeah. Wow. Amir, thank you so much, man. Um, I just am so grateful that you took some time out of your day to be on our uh, channel. And I would love for you to share a little bit as we kind of close this out. Uh, tell us a little bit about Behold Israel, the yeah. organization that you are uh, the founder and the CEO and, and uh, you started, as well yes. as uh, some books that you have that you yeah. think would be really, really impactful for uh, my listeners. We'd love to, to support yeah. you. So Behold Israel is basically a ministry that teaches about Israel and about the role of Israel in the end times, but also teaches uh, uh, you know, about Bible prophecy in general. It also a source of news from Israel. We give news. I have a Telegram channel with over 260,000 subscribers there with news every day all around the clock. And because, the, you know, so many biased uh, sources today. Um, and again, we travel and teach in conferences. We, we bring tours to Israel to teach them in the land. And we also have ministry online. And I write books. The latest book is Revealing revelation and that is it's already a bestseller on on wall street journal usa today publishers weekly and this book is to a journey through the 22 chapters of revelation mm -hmm. i also write for the non-christians i write novels such as operation yoktan and it's thrillers basically and now we have a sequel that will come uh, in a few months and that is a way, a subtle way to bring the gospel to non-believers who love thrillers and fiction and would never, you know, approach Christian bookstores. So that's another way for us to approach people with the gospel. We love the Lord. We want to see the church coming back to understanding its role, to understanding the role of Israel. And uh, we're looking forward uh, to, to our rapture uh, that will soon come. That is awesome, Amir. Thank you so much. And guys, by the way, Amir did not mention this, but they also have a YouTube channel with over 600,000 subscribers as of the time of the recording of this video. And so if you are really interested in, you know, end time events and, and Israel and, and all the different things that we talked about today, Bible prophecy, I highly encourage you to go and subscribe to uh, the Behold Israel YouTube channel. I'm going to put a link to that as well as a link to their website, as well as a link to all their social media, as well as a link to uh, all of the books that uh, Amir mentioned so that you can support him. Listen, we need your support, guys. Um, you know, this is what we do. This is how we're able to make it. And so we would appreciate if you all would take just some time to go to Amazon and uh, or go to the links and just simply order a couple of books. All right. And, and just doing that small thing can be a blessing to their organization. And so, uh, Amir, thank you so much. And by the way, um, yeah. I'm going to be going to Israel for the first time in my life, taking a group of 40 people this November 10th through the 20, 20th wow. right, of 2022. And uh, uh, depending upon when this video comes out, we may or may not have any spots available for you to be able to join me on a 10-day uh, pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Uh, we'll probably be all filled up by the time this video comes out. But um, man, if you're there and man, I would, you know, maybe it would be great just to shake your hand and get to know you. But obviously I know we're going to be on the move and you you lead a busy life as well. But uh, we're going to keep in touch. Well, and uh, might there, really get there, I would love to see you. Yes, I would love that. I, we, we were definitely going to be there for 10 days, 11, well, 10 days, November 10th through the 20th. And so we'll be in touch. And uh, for all of you watching, thank you so much. Uh, any final words you want to share with us, Amir? I want to share with everyone that, you know, the world is not going to the right direction yet. It's going to the prophesied direction. God is in full control. I want to urge people not to play with their destiny and their future, to give their life to the Lord, to follow, not to trust governments and horses and chariots and parliaments and military 
forces. First and foremost, trust the Lord and his word. Obey, you know, authorities, yes, but I'm just saying the trust that we have, the peace that we will get, uh, uh, the hope that we have is not in anything of this world. It's in the Lord. And so, you know, the more you can, please exercise your a uh, role of an ambassador for Christ to implore people to be reconciled to him. And of course, that's the battle. And that's, that's, you know, this is what you need to do and not fight for other things that are less important and they're not eternal. We live in a temporary world, but we need to have eternal perspective. Amen. Amen. What a great way to end. So Amir, thanks so much again for being my guest today and um, super excited about what God is doing in and through your ministry and your testimony. We'll continue to pray for you and partner with you. And uh, once again, thank you all so much for taking the time out of your day to watch this. Go support, check all the links down below, and I'll see you in the next Beat video. Bye for now.